It was a hundred years ago this spring. A teenage boy named Dick Rowland, just a teenager, um, he was at grave risk of being lynched. Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma had had uh, defendants dragged out of the courthouse, dragged out of the jail before, and lynched in the streets. In May 1921, when Dick Rowland had been arrested in Tulsa, there was fairly good reason to believe that it was going to happen again. A local paper, the Tulsa Tribune, had published an account on May 31st, 1921, that essentially accused this black teenager, Dick Rowland, of rape. Uh, he, he worked as a shoeshine boy at a building in downtown Tulsa. The paper, in red-hot terms, essentially accused him of sexually assaulting a white teenage girl who worked as an elevator operator at the building where he worked. And teenage Dick Rowland was arrested that day. And after he was arrested, a mob, apparently a large mob of white Tulsa residents, started gathering at the courthouse demanding, basically, to get their hands on him. And Tulsa was a bustling city at the time. Uh, a lot of business, specifically a lot of oil business, was running through Tulsa. And it was a segregated city. Most of the African-American population in Tulsa lived in a neighborhood called Greenwood, uh, which was a segregated black neighborhood, but it was also a flourishing neighborhood a bustling part of town in its own right. It had a—Greenwood uh, had a hospital and schools and churches and hotels and bars and restaurants and jewelry stores and theaters, at least two different Black-run newspapers, a solid Black professional class, a solid Black economy in that neighborhood. Greenwood also had a considerable number of African-American men, some of whom were World War I veterans who were not only concerned that young Dick Rowland was going to be lynched that day at Tulsa's courthouse, they were also willing to take concerted action to try to prevent that from happening. And so that day in 1921, as the white, angry mob grew and grew at the courthouse and the sheriff tried to hold the white, angry mob at bay, a contingent of armed black men from Greenwood came to the courthouse, too, to supplement the protection, basically, for young Dick Rowland while he was in a jail cell inside and that growing mob outside was baying for his blood. And there is more, there's much more to be said about what happened then in the ensuing 18 hours. As we come up to the 100-year anniversary of that conflagration, which is uh, next month, May 31st, you will hear much more about what happened on May 31st and into June 1st, 1921. But the long and the short of it is that there was a firefight at the courthouse, a gun battle. The white population of Tulsa and ultimately surrounding areas as well, they decided that this was the sign they had been waiting for, I guess, of some kind of black insurrection in Greenwood, which they took as cause for both all-out hysteria and all-out war. White mobs, literally thousands of white people, stormed the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, and they destroyed it. 36 blocks of the city of Tulsa, they just destroyed. And, you know, whatever the sheriff may have done to try to protect teenage Dick Rowland at the courthouse to keep him from being lynched, he did survive. They dropped all the charges against him, ultimately. The inquiry into what happened at that office building and that elevator concluded that he did nothing wrong. But once the mob had decided that black Tulsa had to be wiped out in this confrontation, local law enforcement not only didn't protect Black Tulsa, they formally deputized members of the white mob. They gave out guns and ammunition to white men and told them to go get them in the, in the Greenwood neighborhood. And in the Greenwood neighborhood, the hospital burned to the ground and the school burned to the ground and the library and the churches and the hotels and the stores and both the newspapers. The white mob burned more than 1,200 private homes. More than 1,200. They looted hundreds more that didn't burn. Local law enforcement wholesale rounded up black people, thousands of black people off the streets and out of whatever homes and buildings remained and locked them up, thousands of them, at the local fairgrounds left thousands of black Tulsans interned, basically, at the local fairgrounds for days. And of course, when they were released, the black part of town where they lived, where they worked, had been destroyed. It looked like it had been carpet bombed in a war. Thousands of families homeless. 
Black Tulsa burned out and destroyed. And we still can't say exactly how many people died. Newspaper headlines from the time tended to focus exclusively on the number of white people who were killed in the conflagration, just ignoring the black victims. The first histories of the attack on Greenwood, the, the, the Tulsa Race Massacre, counted dozens of victims, dozens of people killed. A state commission in 2001 said the number of people murdered that day was probably more like hundreds, somewhere between 175 and 300. But we're still figuring it out now, honestly. We still don't know. In 2015, 14 years after that state commission in 2001 issued that report, a long-lost manuscript was discovered in a storage unit. It was handed over to the Smithsonian, to the new National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is why we can access it today. And it's a remarkable document. The manuscript was the typed and carefully preserved eyewitness account of the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921 by a man who survived it, a prominent black Tulsa lawyer named Buck Colbert Franklin. Among other things, the Buck Franklin manuscript described turpentine firebombs firebombs being dropped on major buildings in Greenwood from above, from small planes, privately operated planes that were brought in to drop bombs on the black neighborhood. What he described was basically improvised airstrikes from private aircraft along with the mobs in the streets. He also described machine gun fire turned loose against the black civilians in Greenwood in the streets. Again, that, that manuscript was only discovered six years ago. Our understanding of what happened 100 years ago is still growing as we close in on this 100-year centennial since it happened. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.